Welcome to the Next Phase Podcast, covering the latest trends in competitive Age of Sigmar with your host, Ben Schimoller. In this episode, we take a look at the current Age of Sigmar meta, starting with a look back at last month's competitive events. In segment one, the previous phase. Welcome to the next phase brought to you by In Your Phase Network. I'm Ben, and today with me, I've got Tom, who's the TO of the Old Town Throwdown, uh, the assistant TO of the Lone Star Open, the SoCal Open, and of course, the Las Vegas Open, and our 2020 ITC Best Blades of Corn, maybe. And then in addition <laughs> here, we've got uh, Jeremy Vessier, the French overlord, uh, and he's our 2019 ITC champion. He's the 2022 team captain America, and we're excited to get into some good discussions with these guys. How are you like, going? Good, thanks. Pretty good. Excited to be here. Awesome. <laughs> thanks for so much again for joining us. So uh, to start off, let's take a look at maybe uh, how LVO went, what we're thinking post-meta. I know, Jeremy, you didn't attend, but obviously you got your eye on the ball, your focus while being on Team America. You're not looking away from the ITC. Tom, you had a great perspective as a TO there. What are your thoughts? Maybe we'll start with Tom. Um, so thoughts on LVO. It was a fantastic event. Really enjoyed doing it. Um, I was lucky enough to be the judge on all of the final tables on the final day. So I had the best seat in the house. I was able to watch uh, Gavin win the whole thing. Um, yeah, the, the last game was streamed and was probably the least exciting game of the whole day. But the, uh, the semifinals in particular were some great games of Warhammer and some real uh, tactical stuff going on. It was, it was a great experience and really good to see that high-level play going on. Great. Awesome. What are your thoughts of LVO, Jeremy? I, I think uh, as much as it is a win to Gavin, it's a win for Team America in a sense, since Gavin is uh, playing for the team as well uh, in, you know, you look, you know, looking at a strong leader for the entire season, finishing strong. Cause I think, uh, uh, out of all of the ITC winners, I think him and, uh, Bill Sousa are the only one who've ever won LVO and ITC, right? Like, so the year you win LVO, you, or you also won the ITC season. I, I don't think Garrett has that, um, uh, down in his mantle either. So I think it's just, yeah, Bill and Gavin. So congratulations to uh, Gavin. But overall, I, I did watch a stream of that game. I echo Tom's comment. That's probably the least exciting game I've uh, probably seen. But, you know, as a captain of Team Mary, I got to see my competition play. Uh, I took down some notes, so it was cool. <laughs> Thanks for that. <laughs> and I think, uh, just as an aside, Levan's semifinal game against the Stormcast uh, Shootcast was just tactically brilliant and he, he played really well so it was just a shame that the whole world didn't see that game and just got to see him in the final where there was just not a lot he could do yeah uh, i think fatigue really took a hold of him in that game so i look yeah. forward to watching him uh in this next performances I definitely see him at uh i hope he'll be at the grok gang event in toronto where uh, basically team canada and team america are going to be effectively playing each other at the gt <laughs> excellent so <laughs> Awesome. Well, I appreciate your thoughts. A quick follow-up maybe then. What do you think, how, how do you think the performances of LVO um, lead into what is hot uh, currently and what is hot coming right out of LVO? Well, I think the, the one thing about the anyone who looked at the lists in LVO, the first thing they noticed is just dragons. Dragons, dragons, dragons. I, I think there was over 110 dragons at the event with just 170 players. So just an insane number of dragons there. Um, and I think, although the events since LVO, and we'll, we'll talk about that a bit later maybe, but there haven't been as many dragons, but the one take from LVO is you need to be able to deal with dragons and you need to be able to deal with a lot of movement because they have movement in the hero phase and they can move a lot anyway. And then obviously Gavin's winning list, which is dragons in living city. So you've got deep striking dragons or deep striking fulminators and you need to be able to handle that. I think that's the big takeaway that people are going to have. Jeremy, your thoughts. Um, so the way I would describe it uh, to basically, in addition to Tom's points, which were all relevant was the fact that uh, the game is now multidimensional. It's not as singular dimension as we're playing. We're used to playing where, uh, we 
we're playing into a shooting teleporting meta uh, and now the game is revolving back to more of a melee based combat i mean dragons are a little bit kind of a you know weird addition because they also have pretty decent shooting in a sense um so but they're what's strong is that they get to choose their fights and they get to choose when they fight if uh and that's a big thing about the dictating the tempo of the game and all the players that did well with dragons are players who have mastered the art of dictating tempo uh because i think it was what two players effectively in the top uh the last set of rounds that ended up being a dragon player was um James. joseph crier and james right joe yes. crier and james and then gav if you include gav yeah, the Living Cities is a bit of a weird like dichotomy because it has a, it has the additional multi-dimensional mechanic, but it's it's hard to call it like a dragon list. Like right. the dragons are a good solid center piece, but they're not necessarily the only piece that matters in that. Um, and yeah, last day I think I say mo- with the down you know with the what's it called the downfall of giants. The test used to be can you beat giants and also potentially dragons. And I think we're seeing a lot less Giants players now. So it's coming back down to, can you just beat Giants? Or sorry, uh, Dragons. And I, I think that's an important point that you know, Dragons have been on the decline. i uh, sorry, Giants have been on the decline. But there were still a number of Giant lists right. at Elvio. They were still popular. They just didn't do very well. Uh, there yeah. was just one, four, and one with Giants. And the others all fell by the wayside pretty early on. So I think that's been the last death now for Giants. Tom King and Jeremy, too, can you both go into maybe a little bit more about why the decline of Giants? Uh, I'll, I'll start first and John can oh. follow up and they can say, um, I will say it's because everybody kind of associates, you know, Giants are good. I need to be Giants. So if I'm going to design a competitive list, I, that's the first barometer test I have to pass. Uh, and what ended up happening is the last two books that came out, which were Stormcast and Iron Jaws, those books do really good against giants period for the most part. So there was no necessarily like if you were designing one army out of those two options, you were going to do be fine against giants without actually forcing yourself to design an army to be giants. Uh, and if you were designing an army to kill dragons or kill double mock crusher iron jaws, you're going to be in a great situation to just straight up kill giants. So you're kind of getting the benefit of both ends. Like if you were designing your list to do something, it was going to benefit you against these matchups. These, what's uh, I call the five and O uh, testers, right? Because that's the big thing about giants and the dragon army is can, if you overcome them, you're then probably a five and O army. If you can't overcome those, you're probably not going to be a five and O army effectively. Right. It got to the stage where at all the big tournaments, anyone who was, seriously considering i want to go five and oh i want to go four and one had to have a list that could beat giants and so yeah. as soon as everyone is building lists that can beat giants giants just naturally fall down yep that makes a lot of sense so then as we roll into this new season what players are we thinking that are the ones to watch leading into the itc season all right uh, I don't think any king will last forever. So I think this is the year Gavin basically, I don't think he's going to sit on his laurel, but I don't think any king will last forever. I think Jordan Duncan uh, will be a good player to watch. Uh, this year will be interesting because a few of the old, you know, ITC winners are coming out of semi-retirement in a sense. And I'm including myself into that. Uh, Bill Souza is coming back into the mix of things, you know, as COVID is dying down. Uh, so it's going to be a very interesting uh, season in terms of ITC play for at least uh, the American region. You know, now that ITC is basically almost the global uh, scoring mechanic in a sense, uh, it's going to be interesting to see where like where the other players are fitting on that ladder from the other countries. How do you feel, Tom? I mean, I, so there's two points I'd make. First of all, I think that Gavin has been the trailbreaker for Texans to start taking an ITC. And I think think Gavin would be okay with me saying that he's not even the best player in his club, but he's the only one who's actually embraced, who embraced ITC right. last year. And so if more of Harambe's heroes actually start taking on big events, then I think they're going to have a huge impact. Um, Zach just won the Lone Scar GT last weekend. Uh, he's a Harambe hero and he's a fantastic player. I've managed, I've been lucky enough to see him play live and he's a really good player. So I can see him doing well. And then, yeah, with the GW announcement that they're tying in with ITC, it's going to be interesting how many other countries actually take on ITC for Sigma and what impact does that have? Uh, 
you know, unfortunately, you could have you know a number of players getting a lot of ITC points in, say Australia, who never get to play against the top players here, and so we won't actually know who are the better players unless they go to Worlds or something. Um, but yeah, it's going to be interesting what happens with the, a possible expansion. Just hoping that an expansion does happen. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense for sure. So I have a quick piggyback that uh, it seems like it's only for Jeremy, but I'm very curious for your perspective too, Tom. With AOS Worlds being so early and so many strong players obviously being on Team America and as the ITC has gone global, potentially sucking other big players into it, uh, do you think that's an advantage or disadvantage in terms of ITC points for these players who are having to kind of go back to back uh, big events at AOS Worlds? Uh, probably not, to be honest. Like, I think one of the <laughs> interesting players we're going to see, like, in that, like, maximizing those output is like, you'll have players like Tom Guan, who can basically play and, you know, the drop of a dime in any major event around the world. So, like, all it's going to do is basically, like, give him more opportunities to squeeze out uh, any points in a sense, and also give him the, the opportunity to broaden his horizon in that regard. So, more events does not necessarily translate into, um, you know, a detriment to the players. It just means that they're going to have to think globally more than necessarily thinking locally, right? And the output of like, if you want to measure, you know, not yourself as a player, but measure yourself against the rest of the globe, right? It's not a, it's not a dick measuring contest, the ITC. It's more about, hey, I want to kind of gauge how I'm doing and I want to broaden my uh, scope into like performance on a global scale. So I'm going to go further that um, I think that being on Team America or any of the other teams is going to have a huge plus to you as a player. Simply yeah. the uh, uh, speaking to a lot of the Texans, the reasons that Harambee's Heroes are such a good club right now is because they've got a lot of high quality players who play against each other regularly. Right. And I'm going to assume that Team America, thanks to TTS, are playing regularly against them within themselves and they're all really high quality players so if you are playing three or four games a week with the best players in the country you're only going to get better right and so they'll take that experience and then they'll just walk into tournaments and say i've faced every single army here and i've played them you know eight times in the last week so yeah awesome yeah. well so one quick uh last question for this segment what armies did well for us at lone star and at emerald city this weekend and why, guys? Start at Lone Star, Tom. You're you basically were there. <laughs> uh, so Lone Star um, was won by Zach, who was taking took Seraphon. Seraphon are really strong right now. The Thunder Lizards with um, yeah the redu reduction in damage is extremely good against some of the top lists. They're a good counter meta list right now. So uh, and again, Zach's a fantastic player. Um, Davin came second with Gits. I'm not going to pretend that Gits are a good army because they're not, but he took Kragnos and it's really just Kragnos plus anything else. can be good. <laughs> um, and you know, again, you know, Gavin's a fantastic player, so he yeah. can take anything and he always takes a different list and does well with it. But I don't think we should say that Gits are good. It's just Craggy plus something is good. Um, and then OBR were third and that was a bit of a shock. Um, there was nothing special about that list. It was just Cutacross, uh, Arcan, Mortec Guard, and a Crawler. And, um, you know, just piloted well. It's the standard list that you see in every tournament, but it piloted well and did well. I uh, I don't really have any takeaways out of, out of the Lone Star Open. I just, I do want to point out, like, it's the moral of the story of the quintessential moral of the story. It's if you have a really good player when this is the mechanics of the game, you can still do well with something really bad, depending on like a couple of things go your way. Matchups, uh, if you can capitalize on your opponent's mistake in that most of those matchups. And, you know, as long as you're, you know, uh, what's it called? A well oiled machine like Gavin is, you can do well gets and crackers. But uh, in terms of Emerald City Open, uh, what we saw win was a Legion of the First Prince, but an atypical kind, not really atypical in the Europe sense, but atypical for the American sense, uh, Legion of the First Prince list. It was basically Bellacore, uh, the six inch violin Thurster, um, the Demon Prince of Corn with the, you know, obviously it's reduction of charge. It was like an aggressive control army. And it only had basically um, corn dogs for the most part for its like battle line requirements. So atypical in the sense that it's a kind of an elite 
uh, based uh, Legion of the French Spirits Army. Second place, we had Mason Knox with Thunder Lizard Seraphon. Uh, he also brought something I would consider atypical because he had literally no screens really in his army outside of chameleon skinks, uh, which is uh, not a, I think, a choice most people make in, the, in that building that kind of list. And in third place, I think we had Alex Gonzalez of the show with uh, his soap light list. But in reality, for me, I, I think uh, I think Ben here on the show takes uh, <laughs> the podium with his uh, basically uh, Stormcast list, which, hey, Ben, do you feel like playing against really good players constantly gives you the, uh, the opportunity to be better at the game? You know, to be honest, I think it mostly boils down to whether or not you got it naturally. Uh, no, of course. <laughs> I had, I had uh, some great practice games uh, with Jeremy shortly before going to Emerald City, and uh, I had the privilege of making it undefeated to the final table where uh, Matt properly stomped me, played great, but I had a lot of fun. So, But we're not here to talk about me, even though I would like that. <laughs> uh, so what – all right, last little 15 seconds each, gentlemen. What do we think is the biggest takeaway from the meta? What's going to be hot immediately next? Ooh, Tom, you want to go first on that one? Or you want me to go first? Uh, you can take that one, what I think. Uh, sure. Uh, if I was going to define the meta by popularity, I think we're going to see a lot of, like, shark lists of turtles uh, when Deepkin comes out <laughs> in, like, two weeks. Uh, but in terms of what's probably actually good to the ga- in the game, uh, I still think we're going to see a domineering, uh, d- uh, you know, not necessarily dragon-only meta, but, like, dragon and adjacency meta. Uh, because I think dragons just fit. They f- like, for example, for me, like I'll play KO of dragons because they fix a lot of downsides of KO for 3.0. So like, there's just like, they just fit so well on like so many armies and my, that need monsters that can perform. You, how about you, Tom? Yeah, I think that's uh, a fair take. I think we're going to see dragons. I'm not necessarily in Stormcast, as you said. I think it's just every order army is going to be allying yeah. in two or four dragons. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Well, I appreciate your thoughts, gentlemen, for sure. This is great stuff. And uh, we're eager to roll into the next segment, which is then how to play. So we'll see you shortly and get your thoughts there. Those guys really know their stuff. How does Ben keep up with their banter? Stay tuned for segment two in your current phase.